15, 20 minutes. Some of them oh. waiting for more than an hour to oh ask you questions. I'm sorry Dr. I could Ross. be waiting. It's totally fine. The more the merrier. A lot of people waiting. I already see a lot of people chiming in, typing in those questions. So um, before I get to viewer questions, because I know a lot are coming in, I have my own question oh, please, that I really want to ask you about because today is National Stress Awareness Day. It's the number one trend on Twitter. It's n trending nationwide. And I want to talk to you about the importance of stress management and maintaining one's mental health because so often here on News Now, for example, we're covering so many news stories and a lot of times we bring in the topic of mental health. Just now we were talking about the Fox Cop, um, Fox Lake, Illinois cop who apparently shot himself and one of the things they mentioned in the press conference, uh, the specific quote was, untreated depression leads to, uh, or 90% of the time leads to suicide. Mm -hmm. And so that's just an example. Yeah. of people just not really taking care of themselves. So I want your take on the importance of that. Well, there was a big piece yesterday in the New York Times. Um, actually, it was a published document, but they happened to write about it in the Times. Uh, but in the peer-reviewed journal publication, they looked at death rates in, among Americans. And the one group where it's increasing pretty rapidly is middle-aged white people. And it was sort of stunning because none of us expected that kind of an output. And what's, what's happening is people are depressed. They don't feel like they control their destiny. They expect to have more control over what's happening in their lives than they think. And so, unfortunately, suicide, which is a long-term solution to a short-term problem, because suicide is generally a 36-hour feeling of despair that you can, you can get through if you can just hold on a little bit. But depression takes away the technicolor part of life, makes it all black and white. So uh, it's one of the reasons that on November the 19th, I can take the opportunity, working with the White House and many other groups, uh, there's a coalition of folks saying, let's take by that night, the 19th of November, talking to our families about addiction. Because what ends up happening is people start to slip from depression into addiction, especially with pills now so readily available, mm -hmm. like especially narcotic pills, like the Oxycontins and the Vicodins of the world. Right. We consume 80% of all the narcotics on the planet in America. We're 5% of the population. And so we want to get ahead of this problem. And it's happening to rich families, poor families, every ethnic group is being effect affected by this. So let's get this conversation happening in our homes and ask simple questions like how are you coping with stress right uh, what's working for you what are your friends doing for stress are any of them resorting to things like drugs or alcohol that we know long term isn't going to really deal with the problem and what i personally like to do because i've been blessed to, to live in a, li a life where i don't have huge challenges at least so far is i go into a place if, if a crowded spot women can do this as well go to the bathroom put the lid down you're not actually going to the toilet <laughs> and just sit there for five minutes and process what's happening in your life to sit there and think. It's almost like meditating in the bathroom, it is, is what you're saying. The reason I say go to the bathroom is people won't bother you there. <laughs> right. You have five minutes to yourself because generally even the kids will respect the bathroom as a place <laughs> they shouldn't bother mom in. And those five minutes can be remarkably powerful in helping you organize your life. Uh, at least there are thoughts for those few moments. You'll function more efficiently. So again, I know we all are working hard, but you got to work smart too. Mm -hmm. And this will allow you to do that. And it allows us as well to process some of these feelings of despair that are normal. And right. you shouldn't run from them. And the most effective treatment for depression for most people is talk therapy, mm -hmm. talking to people about it. Right. And spending five minutes to organize your thoughts in a way you can begin to express them to others is a very fruitful activity. Right. And I, one of the things I want to bring up, because I feel like there are higher rates of depression now than there were 10 years ago, I want to talk to you about the role I guess the internet might be playing in that and social media. One of the stories that was trending all over the country yesterday was this girl that just quit Instagram. She was YouTube famous. and was talking about this like need to become perfect and how you have all that pressure and that stress. And you're almost feeling depressed because if you don't get the number of likes that you want, for example, or the validation from followers, it's, it's affecting you from a mental health perspective. You get graded for doing what's normal talking to people, and if you don't like the way you're graded, you don't think you're talking the right way. It's a false promise that likes translate to doing what's right in your life. Right. And I think there are a lot of people who find that social media is particularly slippery, not because it's not a valuable asset, it obviously is, we can talk right now because of social right. media. I'm getting all these wonderful questions from all you out there. But at the same time, if I take a picture of myself on some beautiful tropical beach and send it to you, it's probably not the perfect representation of what happened to me. I'm gonna embellish it as much as I can. I'm not gonna send a bad picture of myself. I'm not gonna send it on a cloudy day. You know, when You're the beach is closed. You're gonna put the right filter. Right, exactly. And so you end up with a fictitious representation, but it seems real. Mm -hmm. So we compete with each other, and it's never quite as good for you as them because it's never quite as good for them either. It's not reality. Right, and then you put all this effort into a photo and then it might not even get the number of likes you wanted it to get and then you're questioning yourself even more. Yeah. So instead, I think we should remember what social media functionally does for us. Right. And this is connect to people. You can connect in many ways besides social media, but social media does it pretty nicely, but that's all it's there for. And what other people say about you is none of your business. 
It never has been, and you shouldn't take it to heart. And there's someone who's in the public eye. I, there are things written about me all the time that I'm not proud that were written, but it's out there, and I'm okay because I've chosen the life that I have. Many folks don't purposely choose that life, but they're thrust into it because that's what social media does. Right. And it was one of the hardest things I'll tell you for almost anybody yeah. who's in the public eye is getting comfortable with people saying things about you that you don't think are fair. It's okay. Right. It's not personal. Don't take it personal. Right. Just go to the bathroom and just take, Five a, minutes. Breath, take a breather. Yeah. Maybe even go to the bathroom when you're there. <laughs> All right. Well, I know there's so many questions in the chat room. I don't want to neglect them. So we're going to just scroll through a few and you can answer. Um, there was a question for, about kombucha. I know a second yeah, ago you're scrolling. Apple Snapple. Dr. Oz, is kombucha a good replacement for diet soda? Uh, I don't like diet sodas. Not because they're toxic for you. I think they're a bit of a false promise. You don't actually lose weight on a diet soda. The artificial sweeteners actually are so powerful, 200 times more powerful than sugar and being sweet, that they tell your brain, hey, all the sweet's coming in, but your brain says, wait a minute, I didn't get any calories, so how can it really be there? Right. So the brain can't keep up with that. Uh, struggle and so it panics and sends you off to find more food, especially sweet food. Right. And so uh, I don't think the artificial diet f or our foods in general are that effective. So mm -hmm. I'd rather take real food. Kombucha happens to be real. It's fermented, so it gives you some prebiotics and probiotics for your gut. Uh, there's even a little alcohol in it sometimes. <laughs> uh, so I happen to be a fan of it. <laughs> well, speaking of sugars, there was a question that was submitted about an hour ago from one of our viewers, Ale Ben, who had asked, "Is his coffee addiction?" Uh, hurtful to his diabetes. He then clarified, it's not so much an addiction, he drinks three cups a day. I think coffee's okay, okay. in general. Uh, it is the number one source of antioxidants in America. Uh, it is a very effective way of staying more alert. Just be careful about the belief that it's actually giving you energy. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's withdrawing energy from your energy bank that's already yours and giving it to you when you drink the coffee. So by the time the afternoon comes, you're not going to have any energy left in your energy bank. So a cup of coffee, I don't actually drink it first thing in the morning because I don't think I need it. Most people actually don't need it first thing. They need it an hour or two after they get up. I have a second cup of coffee midway through the morning and maybe a third one at lunch at most, mm -hmm. but definitely nothing after that. And most people, if they can get it down to two cups of coffee and start to replace it with green tea, they'll feel more energized in the afternoon. They won't have a cycling up and down. When we do our big diet plans, which we do every January for the show, and we have you know probably five million people who've downloaded the last plan, mm -hmm. the Total 10 plan. One of the things we ask people to do is to cut coffee out for that brief period of time so you don't have the ups and downs. You can hormonally be balanced, so you can actually begin to show up in your own life more effectively. Well, how do you drink your coffee? Well, I, I like a little bit of cream in my coffee, no sugar. Uh, but I do like the cream because it softens it a bit for me. But mm -hmm. I don't drink coffee very much. You know, surgeons, and I still operate on Thursdays. I'm in the operating room doing bowels and corners and stuff. Who gets to have you as a surgeon? How do you <laughs> request Dr. Oz as the surgeon that operates on well, you? I always tell my patients, because a lot of them are patients who came because their families also had surgery with me. I always say, listen, I'm only operating one day a week, so maybe I'll get a co colleague in here and to do it because I can't get to everybody anyway. And my colleagues do it every single day and they're probably you know, really good at this game for that reason. Um, but I enjoy surgery, I enjoy bonding with folks. So, so when people have problems that I'm particularly expertise in, uh, that I have expertise in, like valve problems, mm -hmm. I'll try to take care of them myself. But back to the issue of coffee, the reason I don't drink coffee is twofold. One, it makes your hands shake, which is, you know, you don't want your, hand, you want your hands going like this if you're a heart surgeon. Right. And the second thing is you have to go to the bathroom, at least I do, right. which is a really big problem when you're scrubbed in. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few more questions. I mean, we have a lot of questions. So, uh, Ron Arizona asking, Dr. Oz, is there any studies that show that medical ma marijuana actually works? Ron, uh, mar medical marijuana does work. Um, it's not a panacea. It doesn't work for everything. For things like uh, post-chemo nausea. In fact, I was in Los Angeles yesterday. Mm -hmm. I taped a show in New York, by the way. You're all welcome to come visit. But I was in L.A. visiting. And a woman who was in a flower shop selling me flowers that I was taking to a friend uh, confided in me that she had... Uh, been unable to keep anything down and then she saw me do a show on medical marijuana and realized from Montel Williams who was on my guest on that show right. that it might work and tried it and it changed her life. Wow. Got through her chemo and survived her cancer. Uh, it does work. What it isn't, unfortunately, I think is a good recreational product. And when you have recreational marijuana, it, especially for younger people, builds this belief that it's completely safe. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, it, forget about all the physical issues, it builds a mental uh, uh, crutch that makes you think you actually have to be relax with medical marijuana or something else in order to get through the day. And the brain is not mature to you in your early 20s. So someone who's a teenager who believes that starts using medical marijuana, it's really hard to stop. So you're saying wait till your mid 20s? At least, <laughs> at least. Oh, we have a question actually from one of our Facebook viewers saying, I have a question, I'm, I have my twins with hand, foot, and mouth disease. What is it? Is it a form of chicken pox, herpes? What do I do to soothe it? How do I prevent it? It's a bacterial infection that, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem for folks when they have it. You know, prevention is not touching other people with it. It's treatable, obviously, and your pediatrician should be a great help to you. 
All right, here's a question related, I guess, to National Stress Awareness Day. Rachel saying, Dr. Oz, does the manner of death, such as suicide versus a natural death, have different effects on mourning and, I guess, coping with the loss of a loved one? Suicide is a much more difficult process to get around because in suicide, the person you love the most took themselves from you. So you have both the mourning of losing that person, but you also have the realization there was such dire straits, such pain, that they had trouble getting past uh, the issues they were facing. And you weren't there to help them. And uh, I've had people I know who've committed suicide. I always wonder, is there something I could have done to prevent it? And then you start replaying course, all your interactions. Subtle little mind. things. Maybe he was trying to tell me. Maybe she was trying to hint to me, and I didn't pick up on it. Mm -hmm. So I do find suicide more difficult to get past. Right, right. I'm going to check in with the chat room again. Dr. Oz, what's your opinion on assisted suicide, Robert is asking. See, I think assisted suicide is a very different ball game. And I had uh, Brittany Minard on my, uh, her, her mother on my show uh, earlier this year. Right. Obviously, just, she, just it was the first year anniversary of, of her taking her life. I think assisted suicide makes sense if you want to control your destiny and your life has been taken from you. And when I asked her mom about the fact that it might, for some people, be considered immoral, she said, listen, my, my daughter's life was taken from her. She didn't give it up. It was taken from her when a doctor walked in there and said, you had a brain tumor, you will die. So how she died was all she controlled. And she has the right to control that, to not end up in saliva, of, you know, in a comatose state, but rather to go out in the style that she felt that she would be comfortable in. And she picked her destiny. Isn't the counter argument, though, that there's always that 0.5% chance, that 0.01% chance, that a miracle is going to happen, something's going, divine intervention, I, and I, they're going to survive? Without question, there are miracles. There, and there, and I've on the show many, many times said there's no diagnosis for which there's a 100% mortality rate. Uh, so I'm not saying use assisted suicide the day you get your diagnosis. <laughs> but in her case, she knew what was going to happen. And the day that she began to have problems swallowing, in other words, she couldn't take the pills anymore, mm. was the day she finally made the decision to go because she saw the end coming. And at that point, when you've tried everything and nothing has worked, and you actually have that point, settled into the reality of what's going to happen, because we will all die eventually, right. I think you deserve the right to control that. And by the way, even if I disagree with your decision, and I would not want my loved ones leaving me prematurely, who am I as a third party to influence a, a daughter's discussion with her husband and her mom and everybody else? Her whole family was supportive of her. I think in America, they deserve the right to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And I should not be imposing my will on them in either direction. Right. You just mentioned once you kind of wrap your head around the fact that we're all going to die one day. How would someone process that if they're having anxiety over death, over the death of loved ones, over the death of themselves, just thinking about it as a concept? We all make peace with that concept eventually. I've, done, I've been around death a lot. In heart surgery, it's part of what we do, but I've also had many friends and family we all have who uh, we've lost. And people find that peace in different ways. I think if you search more deeply into the reason you're here, and the, the blissful reality of birth and the reality as well that you're either going to have an afterlife if you believe in that or whatever comes at the end you'll you know you'll you'll work around to uh, most people find when they actually witness death that it's a remarkably peaceful process mm -hmm. people don't get dragged off to death yelling and screaming they reach a point where there's a serenity a grace that accompanies it and that's actually one of the realities that assures me comforts me when i think about my own demise which mm -hmm. you know one day we'll all have so many people uh, asking questions. I don't know how much time you have. I want to answer all of I, your questions. I, I, but I, I know, know it's it's tough. I got to go do a bunch more things, and I've, uh, <laughs> I don't want to keep them waiting either. But listen, I, I on my Facebook page and yeah. my Twitter feed. I mean, I'm diligent about this. So I really try to keep up. But we have a whole bunch of doctors and medical students on the show, staff that are trying to answer your questions as well. So you know, you know go to go to Dr. Oz's to my to my homepage, uh, to any of my social links, my Instagram page, whatever you want to do. But talk to us. I'm, I'll keep the conversation going. Well, you want to take one more question? One more. Can we do one that? One more. Uh, Who's lucky person? Spin, 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 spin. Well, I'm just going to start scrolling and you can decide which one. Uh, well, there are a lot of folks commenting on grieving, which I'm respectful of. It's very uncomfortable when you're feeling pain. And I also don't think you can ever tell anyone how to process their grief, mm -hmm. which is a question I'm seeing in several different ways. Uh, look for solace in the people around you. What has always supported us as a species is a safety net of people around us. Mm -hmm. And our lives are defined by the people in it. So look for comfort there. It's those conversations that are most fulfilling. And I'll leave you maybe with this last answer to a bunch of the questions I'm seeing here uh, from a bunch of uh, folks in the chat room. Uh, happiness is cool. It's mm -hmm. nice. We all want happiness. Right. But happiness is sort of like the bubbles of a soft drink on your tongue. The, they, they, they sparkle, they bubble, they tickle, then they go, they're gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas joy is a deeper, 
more mature feeling. You can get it from being happy, but you can get it from other places as well. And joy can weather the storm of grief because it reflects that there's a deeper uh, uh, and, and a uh, more, uh, with more gravitas uh, uh, element of comfort in life that you're living. Mm -hmm. And so seek joy in life more than just happiness. And if you're happy, great, translate it to joy. If you're in grief, look for joy, <clears throat> moments of, of bliss that happen because you connect with people that otherwise you wouldn't be close to. That's why important ceremonies like funerals and weddings and all the other things that bring us together as a, as a society are so important to us. 